What is going on, YouTube? Welcome back to Fireside Rangers. I'm your host, Eric Wilson. Today, not joined by Will, but joined by Dylan. I know yesterday I said it would be me and Will, but change of plans. We got Dylan here instead. Um, today, we're going to be discussing three keys to beating the Washington Capitals in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, I know yesterday we did a little bit of a preview about that, this upcoming series, a little bit of a reaction, the path that we all took to get to where we are now. But today, let's really get into the nitty gritty. The Rangers have a big mission ahead of them. How are they going to beat the Capitals? And I know it does say three keys, but plot twist, we actually have three keys each. each. So it's really six keys here that we're going to be breaking down and discussing with you all. So we're going to get right on into that. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, ring that bell so you don't miss a notification. If you're watching us on Apple or Spotify, be sure to give us a five-star review. Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. Do you agree with me and Dylan, or is there more stuff that you think needs to happen in order for the Rangers to overcome the Washington Capitals? Lastly, be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms at Fireside Rangers on Instagram, X, and TikTok, because we are really starting to ramp up the socials as we move into the postseason. But before we really get into things, Dylan, how are you doing today? Doing great. Getting ready for some playoff hockey. Last day of the season today around the league. A um, couple of stuff left to be decided out west, and then it's go time for everybody. Quick day off tomorrow before the stress levels go up. Saturday, Sunday for the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, the east is set. The west will be set tonight because today is the last day of the regular season, and then the NHL gets one day break before getting right into the playoffs on Saturday. So it is an exciting time. We're at the point of the year where on my way to work every day, I just listen to Bob O'Reilly. <laughs> on repeat it's become my morning ritual it's 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 that time of year vibes are high rangers get to face the washington capitals but how are they going to beat them i think to me my first of my three keys that it needs to happen in order for the rangers to beat washington it's i think it's the biggest one the first line needs to really step up on 5v5 i mean Kreider has improved you know we were very critical of him early on in the season but i will say i think Kreider is back you know he's him once again, Mika's advantage ad has been improving, but I still don't think he's where we need him to be. I know we, me and Will kind of touched upon this yesterday yep. where we're like, we give him a lot of excuses because, yes, he is still scoring a lot of points. He gets a lot of assists. He is really helping out the power play. But, man, that first line at 5v5 has not been good. And it, it, got, it got a pass in the regular season because everyone else was just so dominant. That's advantage ad not being on top of his game was okay because we were still finding a way to win games but mm -hmm. in the playoffs you know right off the bat and especially moving forward in the playoffs if we are to beat the capitals that first line really needs to be locked in at 5v5 there was a point within the last week of the season where the rangers went like eight periods straight without scoring a 5v5 goal until that was broken by i believe zabanajad or not it even was five. panarin against the islanders i think uh, yeah, it might have been Panarin. I'm not sure, but I, I know Mika did eventually score one at some point. And then there's also Jack Roslovic, where he was brought in not to be like the savior to fix the first line, but kind of help out Kreider and Zabanaja. Drive play, yep. Yeah, drive play. And he's been decent, I'll say. Um, I don't have anything bad to say about Roslovic, but there definitely is room for improvement as the stakes are starting to ramp up. So that's my pretty much my first key is that first line improving at 5v5. Dylan, before you get into your first key, how do you feel about that? Uh, I like that. I think obviously the the stars of the Rangers is where the you know big advantage is for this series. Criders of Benajad are our big guys. We need them to play like our big guys in this series. They need to be like we talk about on the show all the time. People that watch us know they need to be play drivers. They can't be passengers because the depth guys are going to be you know they're not going to be scoring as much as some as us fans would like them to. Crider's advantage, I need to pick that slack up at both five-on-five five and on the power play. And I think all do an interesting one, for me at least, is with Filipino practicing, and obviously we know Wenberg is a center in that third line, and he's done a nice job there. You know, for your for your key, you know, I'll ask you since it's your key, do you think Filipino goes up on that wing and maybe makes that line that much more dangerous? We know he can play wing. We know he can play center. Is that something you could see happening? See, uh, as much as I would like it to, I don't think so. I'm also yeah, not right. sure statistically how it would work because I know once it was announced that Filipino was back skating with the team, we did make a reaction video to it. And a lot of the mm -hmm. fans commented saying, 
that in order for Heedle to be eligible for the playoffs, he had to have played in at least one game since coming off LTIR. But then at the same time, I see people like Vince Bertagliano on Twitter who keep updating us on like Philip Heedle. Like today, he skated with the top six at practice. I think, yeah, I think they just have to be cap compliant. I don't know if there's any game requirements or anything like that. Yeah, so I'm not sure. Like obviously, those who commented that, I don't want to just sit here and tell you that you're wrong. I genuinely yeah. No, I would have to. Me neither. Look, well, I would have to look into the rules and see exactly what it is. Um, but you know, let's just for the sake of the argument say Philip Heedle is eligible to join the team. I don't think we'd see him in the first round. You know, he's still skating, bouncing mm-hmm. back from this multi-month injury that was originally meant to be season-ending. Um, I just think for his own health and safety, hold him out until like the conference finals at minimum, if we make yeah. it that far. Um, but First round, I'm definitely going to say no unless yep. he makes a miraculous jump in his recovery and mm-hmm. let's say like Roslovic is really, really struggling. I think then, that's where you could see it. Maybe if he if he struggles, fans, people are going to get impatient knowing Heedle's there in practice doing stuff and they see him on Ranger social media doing stuff. I think eventually that noise is going to get loud if Roslovic struggles early on. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean – I would obviously love to see Heedle play again this season, but mm-hmm. realistically and for the sake of his recovery, I'd say probably not, but that's just my take on it. You yep. take us yep. your first key. All right. So for my first key, a uh, little bit of an off the board one that I don't know if people would realize, you know, just by watching games, face-off percentage and also puck possession. I'm going to put those two together. The Rangers rank seventh in the NHL in faceoff percentage with 52.3%, and Washington all the way at 29th, so fourth from last. Uh, they're 46.7% on the draw. That is a wide discrepancy. If you look at stats, and a lot of people have been putting on Twitter stat matchups and things like that for this series, that might be the widest discrepancy of stat matchup in this series. The Rangers are a very good faceoff team. They win a lot of offensive zone draws as well. Um many of which they'll run face-off plays off of. We saw a bunch of them this past week. But that could be a massive advantage for the Rangers late in games where there's icings, you know, where there's offsides plays that you have to get guys out there that are going to win draws. The Rangers have four, maybe even five guys, if Brodzinski's available, that can win face-offs. That's a big advantage. Uh, Washington's face-off, you know, wins rely heavily on that top line that they have that they'll run out there with uh, – Ovechkin, uh, if Oshie's healthy, and then uh, some of the other guys that they have up in the top six. But the stats don't lie for this category for me. A top 10 team in faceoffs versus a bottom four team in faceoffs, that's a huge advantage for the Rangers. They they should have no fear of icing the puck or have no fear of, let's say, they're up a goal late in the game, take a shot at the empty net because, you know, they have four centers and four four or five players like Brzezinski, Goudreau, Zibanejad, Wenberg, uh, Trocek, all guys that can win draws late in games. I think that's something that there's a fine line, fine margins. And, you know, some other categories, the teams are closer than people would think. This is not one of them. I think the Rangers need to exploit this and they need to turn it into puck possession uh, because they're a puck possession team. They do very well below the goal line, holding pucks, keeping pucks in the zone. If they can win draws and get pucks right away, they don't have to go win puck battles, which we know they can do, but it's just a significant advantage to keep control the play throughout the game. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with everything that you just said right there. I know you began um, talking about it by saying it might seem obscure, but I know you're new around here, Dylan, but all season long, me and Will, we've been praising the Rangers for their ability to win face-offs. Um, Vincent Trocek in particular. Yep. I, believe there, I don't know if he finished the regular season as the leader, but for a majority of the regular season, he led the NHL yep. in face-off percentage. And, winning those face-offs in crucial moments of the game that gives you that puck possession. That's how you score goals. You know, you can't mm-hmm. score goals and win games when the other team has the puck the entire time. So right. absolutely 100% winning face-offs and keeping that possession of the puck. It's easily a way that the Rangers are going to just dominate Washington. As you mentioned, the Rangers have been phenomenal at it all season. Washington, not so much. It is definitely a stat that needs to be exploited and hopefully it should, you know, yeah, but we'll see. But Let's transition into my second key to beating the Capitals. It's plain and simple. You got to shut down Alex Ovechkin. 
Mm -hmm. um, yesterday in yesterday's video when me and Will were kind of just previewing this series, we took a little bit of a look at Washington's roster. There isn't much there anymore. You no. know, that dominant team that led the Metro for like six seasons straight, yep. it's dwindled. It's dwindled heavily, but at the end of the day, there is still Alex Ovechkin. He's on both power play units, as me and Will learned yesterday. And man, mm -hmm. even though Washington isn't what it used to be, that first power play unit is dangerous. Tom Wilson, Ovechkin, um, it was Oshi, Carlson, yep. Yep. and I forget I forget who the fifth was, but it was another good player. Healthy Nick Backstrom. Yeah, but it, 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 he wasn't on that. He might have been Pacioretty. I'm not you, sure. Yeah, I think you might be right. Yeah, but that's like that. Just the name Alex Ovechkin is dangerous uh, in a, in, a, in and of itself, but. You know, seeing him with still like somewhat dangerous power play right there, it's scary. So, but like you look at the offensive threats that the Capitals do hold, there aren't there aren't too many. Pacioretty's old, like Backstrom's injured, Kuznetsov is gone. Yep. Um, but then there's Ovi, and no yep. matter how hard you play defense against them, he's going to find a way to turn a mm -hmm. casual play into a very good scoring chance against you. So. Not only does the defense, but also Igor Shosturgeon need to just be on lock the entire time. Anytime someone in a red jersey wearing number eight is on the ice, everyone needs to be made aware of it. And they might have to focus a little extra attention on him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it could work in the Rangers' favor because the rest of the Capitals' roster isn't as good as it used to be. You know, you might have that leniency where you can kind of double up on Oveshkin and not immediately put the Rangers in immediate danger. Yep. You know, obviously not to say the Capitals are bad. They made the playoffs for a reason, but they're not what they're used to be. And I think shutting down Ovechkin should be the number one defensive aspect heading into this series. Do not let the great eight, who's getting very close to passing Wayne Gretzky in all-time goals. And will. He will. Yeah, and he will. Do not let him dominate you offensively. Like the 100%. Rangers lock in and really just shut him down. But I know you agree with that. But if there's yep. anything you want to add, you can before you head into your second one. Yeah, I think even just... Is there, you know, I know I have my stance on this. I think that should be a Miller-Schneider assignment. I don't know about you, but I think those two guys probably would possess our best shutdown pair in, in this series. With their speed, I don't think Ovechkin can use – Ovechkin's lost a step. He's not fast. Now, under no circumstances am I saying he can't still score goals from anywhere on the ice. He could score them from the crowd if he wanted to. But I think you need to put speed on Ovechkin. You need to – have guys that could stay on his hip because he's not going to be able to accelerate past a guy like Keandre Miller or a guy like Braden Schneider. And I don't know, I think forwards wise, even you could have Wenberg line out there against him to kind of check, check him, keep him in place. I think that to me sounds like a good matchup, especially while we're home. Uh, I don't know what you think about that, but yeah, I mean, I haven't really put too much thought into like which defensive pair yeah. I would be like, all right, you're on mm -hmm. OV duty. But I definitely agree with you that there needs to be a player with decent speed, you know, to just follow him around the ice and track him. But then at the same time, I think you need a really tough defenseman who's yep. not going to be afraid to just jump and lay out his body in front of those shots. Um, so to me, I think our top pairing would be the most like that, where Fox can be that quick, Fox crappy Henry. guy, and yep. Ryan Lindgren will just shatter all of his ribs for like the 15th <laughs> time this season. Yeah. <laughs> by blocking an OB shot. Obviously, Jacob Truba would be very good at that, too, mm -hmm. but I don't really see Eric Gustafson being the Agreed. The, the crafty, quick guy. But either yeah. of those two top pairings, I think, could work um, de defending against Ovechkin. Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah, but take us into your next one. All right, so number two key for me of the first round, special teams. Rangers are third on the power play. Uh, Washington is 17th, Rangers percentage 26.4%. Capitals are 17th at 20.6%. Uh, and then for the penalty kill, Rangers are also in the top three. They're third, 84.5%. Washington, PK, sits 19th, 79%. Uh, Washington is a team that honestly is a statistical anomaly. So when you're looking at the numbers, everything tells you this team shouldn't be in the playoffs. There's no difference for their special teams. Everybody knows the Rangers have an exceptional power play. They need to take advantage of these chances on the power play because Washington's PK, I was actually watching a little bit of their game against the Flyers. And for, you know, for people that don't know, there's kind of two ways teams will defend a penalty kill. They'll play a box. They'll play a diamond. Washington plays some form of a hybrid. Uh, so they kind of leave some space to go east-west, which is this big strength of the Rangers where they'll go 
make those plays Panera and disadvantage at across the top of the key uh, or even Fox to one of the other sides. Rangers need to exploit that. I don't, I don't see anything with Washington's penalty kill. That's really concerning. And then to flip it our way, obviously you were talking about Ovechkin. We know Washington's power play. It's going to run through him. He's on both units, like we've already said. Uh, if they, they're going to try and tee him up for that one-timer, if we can cut that one-timer off, cut those passing lanes off, I think the Rangers will be able to kill those no problem. And especially with the speed of the Rangers, they could even turn those uh, you know, cross-ice passes attempts for Ovechkin into offensive rushes the other way, which we've seen them do the last couple games, a couple shorthanded goals, two shorthanded goals in the last two games. So I think, you know, special teams always makes a difference in a playoff series. But I feel like the, it, this is something that could be, ma- you know, magnified in this series, especially because of the discrepancy between the two teams. It's not like, you know, you have two top 10 penalty kills and two top 10 power plays. There's a wide discrepancy. And we know the Rangers don't need many opportunities, the, you know, one for two kind of thing. And like I said, penal- power plays and penalty kills, sometimes it manifests in the playoffs. Sometimes it doesn't. We know the officials get tighter with what they're going to call. But when you do get calls because they're hockey it's going to come, you know, even if it's delay a game or whatever, you have to capitalize on them or kill them off. There'll be big momentum kill, uh, momentum swings, you know, big penalty kills at MSG. Fans are going to be on their feet every time that puck gets iced. And even big chances on the power play, fans will be into that as well. So you got to play the momentum swing, I think, with the special teams. And I think it goes good segue off of what you said about Ovechkin uh, with shutting down that play. Oh, 1,000 percent. Special teams is very, very important, especially in the playoffs. I mean, just look at the Rangers throughout the regular season. We Like I said before, that we need to improve at 5v5 play, and that is true. Yep. But the Rangers, um, as Johnny Lazarus said when we had him on the channel earlier this season, the Rangers live and die by their power play. There is a point where the only goals we were scoring were coming on special teams. Mm-hmm. And I hope that will change moving into the postseason, but God forbid it doesn't change. The Rangers are really going to need to find a way to score power play goals. Um, I don't want to just keep building on to the OV discussion, you know, with penalty killing, because we kind of already talked about it for a few minutes, but just yeah. I'll, I'll triple down on it. Like penalty kill really needs to step up. Do not let mm-hmm. Ovechkin score. That's a dangerous first unit to have out there, especially considering that Ovechkin and John Carlson are playing on both power play units right now. Yep. So Rangers special teams definitely have their work cut out for them, but there's not a doubt in my mind that they can pull it off. So I'm going to, quickly transition into my final key to beating the Capitals. It's one word, one word only, Panarin. I mean, look at what happened last playoffs. Panarin carried the Rangers in the regular season. Playoff started, had a few points in game one, and then disappeared from the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Um, It's been later revealed that his relationship with Gerard Gallant was a big part of that. They had a big falling out in front of the entire team, and Panarin's confidence wasn't really there. But now he shaved his head. He's back, had a career year, 120 points in the regular season, over 100 for the first time in his career. The only thing we need left for him now is to just keep it up in the playoffs. Yep. We know he's a regular season beast, but realistically, through all of his years with the Rangers, he hasn't really shown us much in the playoffs. I think his only memorable playoff moment was that overtime winner against Pittsburgh yep. that sent us to the second round, but... You know, other than that, he hasn't really done much in the playoffs, as much as I hate to say it, as because you know, I'm a major Artemi Panarin fan. We mm-hmm. really want to step up this season. He's had the best season of his life, and that needs to continue heading into next week. Yeah. And there, if he shuts down, a major part of our offense production is just wiped off the board. So, you know, I hate to say that one player might be a m- massive key to winning a playoff series, but he is. It's Artemi yeah. Panarin. And he's the heart and soul of our offensive core, and we need him, and he cannot shut down at all. Hopefully the no. pressure does not become too much for him. He's able to just keep you know, his head like ready to, ready to go, mm-hmm. plays hot like he has all season. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point he's having fun with the pressure almost. You see the way he's talking to the media. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but Vince Mercagliano put out a piece uh, over at the, the – the, what is he? I think he's for the Lowhead Sports, I think he is. Yeah, he is. Uh, but – Vince put out a piece about, you know, just Panarin's different mentality from year to year, from last year to this year. I think Peter LaVillette has allowed him to play free. And I think with that, I think he just, he's a guy who has fun playing the game. He always has, you know, from the leg kicks or the, uh, the stick celebrations that he does. He, He just has fun playing it. So, you know, I think 
obviously he needs he needs to have a big series for us. I think he will. I think he's been one of the best players in the league all year. 100% he has. It's just the bread man. We know him. We love him. Yep. Dylan, tell me your final key, and we'll get to wrapping things up here. Yep. Final key for me, coaching experience. Peter Laviolette has one Stanley Cup, three appearances in it. Uh, took Philadelphia there in 2010, Nashville in 2017, and Carolina, where he won his first Stanley Cup in 2006. He's coached 154 playoff games. Spencer Carberry, zero. Now, Spencer Carberry is a tremendous coach. He's done a tremendous job with this team. This is not, as we've all kind of said, this is not a roster that belongs in the playoffs. Spencer Carberry kind of took this team into the playoffs and has done a tremendous job. Actually interviewed with the Rangers, if you remember, before taking the Capitals job. Uh, but this guy's a really good coach. He honestly, based on the definition, might have my vote for coach of the year. Uh, he's been tremendous. What he's done with a team that sold at the deadline and to still get them in the playoffs is extremely impressive. So I think the coaching experience, though, will show the playoffs is a different animal. I mean, you need to be on top of things. You need to pay attention to matchup. You need to know who's on the ice at what times. I think Peter LaViolette won't – he's not going to panic. He hasn't all year, uh, and he's never really panicked in his playoff career. I don't see him now turning around and panicking here in New York. And I'm not so sh- – we've never seen it with Carberry. I think it's it's new territory for him. Now, again, I'm not discounting what he's done. I think he's done a tremendous job. But I think in the playoffs, you build on that experience. That's why the Rangers went out and brought Peter LaViolette here. And I think now we're going to see it manifest itself against an inexperienced head coach in Washington. Of course, experience pays in the in the NHL playoffs, and LaViolette most certainly has it. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but LaViolette was the coach of the Capitals at one point recently, right? Yep, last season. Yeah, so ex- exactly. So not even does he know the way of the NHL. He knows the Capitals. You know, yes. He's coached Ovechkin. He, and, you know, I know that the Capitals have sold quite a bit this season, but – the team is still kind of relatively similar. Like he knows how these players work and how they want to play. It's mm-hmm. going to be a very underrated piece of that coaching aspect that we're all looking forward to watching. Just Laviolette's masterclass from the regular season transition into the playoffs. So it's definitely going to be an exciting series, no matter what the outcome. But we will be sure to be following this entire series as it approaches, as it goes on, and whatever comes after. So. If you want to be a part of that journey that we're going to go on together, make sure you like, subscribe, ring that bell so you don't miss a notification. If you're watching us on Apple or Spotify, be sure to give us a five-star review. Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. Did we cover everything, or is there something else on your mind that you want us to hear? Lastly, be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms, at Fireside Rangers on Instagram, X, and TikTok. Have a good one. We'll be back tomorrow with more Rangers content. Have a good one. And let's go, Rangers.